back for a second time, I believe, on Bad Faith Podcast. We have with us today Abby Martin, perhaps one of the most important journalists for the current political context. You know her as the creator and host of The Empire Files, also a documentarian. Welcome back, Abby Martin. Thank you so much for having me again. It's great to be on. Now, you have been very busy. Um, I think a lot of people want to pick your brain right now because you're one of the few um, kind of independent media journalists who has spent a lot of time on the ground in the region currently in dispute. And I just wanted, first and foremost, to get um, your takes, your impression on what the coverage is looking like, not just in the media aftermath of October 7th, but now that we're almost two months out um, from that initial date. The media... Uh, coverage has been completely abysmal, Bri. I, I Every time something erupts in Gaza or the West Bank, I keep thinking, how could it get any worse? How could it get any mm. more egregiously one-sided? And they just keep topping themselves. Uh, and and I, I honestly think the Western media is complicit in the genocide that we're seeing unfold right now. And, you know, context is extremely important with both of these, with the West Bank and with Gaza. But right now, Israel's committing a clear textbook case of genocide. And the fact that the Western media is sitting back and absolving this, uh, justifying it, and also denying the Palestinian reality is just completely beyond the pale. And they should be charged as such. I mean, I saw you picking up on some really kind of gross instances of print media using passive voice to seemingly try to uh, desensitize the audience to horrific stories that they feel at least compelled to report on, but in the least visceral way possible. Uh, the um, Was it the Washington Post reported on the um, babies in the NICU that were left behind after a hospital, a Gaza hospital was evacuated, who were left to not only die, but then start to decompose in their uh, incubators. This is the, the headline from the Washington Post, four fragile lives found ended an evacuated Gaza hospital, not left to die, not killed because of the choices of the IDF who told the doctors to leave them behind and affirmed that they were going to be safe, but simply passively found ended. There was another retraction that had to be made over the weekend from the Jerusalem Post. I'm not sure if you saw this, Abby, where mm -hmm. a, vi a viral video of a man clutching a deceased uh, baby in obvious anguish uh, was characterized as him holding a fake doll. Uh, the Jerusalem Post later had to retract that, but did so without actually saying what it was that they were retracting, just saying that we had made a mistake, not actually saying specifically what story they were even talking about. If you hadn't seen the initial story, you wouldn't even know what the retraction was pertaining to. And I, I, I want to give you an opportunity as someone who has done some of the most important on the ground reporting uh, in the Western media, at least, uh, what you make of the gap between what the Western media is printing, including the Jerusalem Post and some Israeli outlet outlets, and what we're seeing from Palestinian journalists, 70 of whom haven't been killed already, mm -hmm. but Palestinian journalists on the ground in Gaza. Bree, it is unconscionable what the, what the media is doing. I mean, you mentioned passive voice. Let's just explore that for a second. Whether it's uh, Palestinians died um, not pointing to who is killing them. You have UN accounts just saying we're we're very sad at the tragic passing of our colleagues without pointing out who is killing them. Um, Washington Post also tweeted out a, a Reporters Without Borders conclusive study that showed several journalists were targeted in, a, in targeted assassinations. And their headline just said, this report found that this journalist was targeted and killed, not said who killed them. This passive voice has been present for a very long time. It's just so egregious, especially in the current onslaught. Um, when the Ali Arab hospital was uh, targeted in Israel's war on hospitals and 500 souls lost their lives, they were extinguished. The headlines were absurd. Not only did they, they, they switch right when Israel tried to blame the Islamic Jihad for the errant missile, which turned out to be false and debunked, um, but the headlines just kind of followed suit with what is whatever Israel's propaganda machine was putting out there, first blaming it on Islamic Jihad and Hamas militants, um, and then just saying, oh, both sides are blaming each other. We don't know what happened. And then, of course, uh, of course, eventually just 
saying a blast, the explosion, not saying what caused the explosion, who caused the explosion. You saw people like Elizabeth Warren condemning explosions <laughs> that were just mm -hmm. innocuously yeah, just happening all over the Gaza Strip. Um, and then it comes to this notion that Palestinians are faking the atrocities. And I want to point out this conspiracy theory because top Israeli government ministers, media officials are running with this narrative and putting it out there and trying to actually claim that the atrocities that are unfolding that we're seeing dictated real time by Palestinians forced to live stream their most vulnerable moments because you have monsters like Joe Biden actually discrediting their reality and their truth of how many people are dying in mass that they have to film themselves, Brie. Um, they don't want to film their own suffering. They probably want to grieve in peace. They probably want to dig their deceased relatives and, and friends and colleagues out of the rubble in peace, not with cameras filming them, but they have to. They've been forced to show the world this because the world is, is denying their most basic right, which is the truth of their lives, of their genocide. And we can't even give them that. Um, the Jerusalem Post run by Avi Mayer, who's essentially a stenographer for the IDF, he's he's essentially a military propagandist running one of the biggest newspapers in Israel. Um, they had the audacity to try to discredit and run with that Hollywood propaganda narrative that Palestinians are faking their own atrocities by running with a tweet and an article claiming that one of the deceased children was a doll. Um, this was completely disproven immediately debunked. And it just, it, it stayed up for far too long, Brie. And as you mentioned, no one took accountability for the egregious lie. No one actually said clearly, this was horrific that we put this out there and we apologized to the victims. No, they just quietly took it down and issued a retraction. And just like the 40 beheaded babies, just like the mass rape and systematic sexual violence that was alleged, during October 7th, once you put these headlines out there and they're cemented and plastered around the world on the front page of every major newspaper, once they're debunked and, and retracted days later, no one sees those. And so you see this propaganda circulated and cemented as truth. That is why it is so horrific to put out this these lies, because no one will see the debunking. And I see this now parroted as if it's just true. Right. That that mass rape yeah. and beheaded babies and, and the dehumanization of Palestinians. Um, this is this is how it happens, Bree, is you dehumanize people to the point of animals and it makes the atrocities committed against them that much more OK and normalized. And that's what we're seeing happen right now. Yeah, I want to get specifically into these claims about the um, per, the mass rapes, because um, that does really seem to be where a lot of the establishment news focus is heading right now at this moment. Before before we get there, I do want to just get back to um, the point that you made about that um, first, not the first hospital bombing, but one of the first big con ones in contention, the Al-Ahi Baptist hospital bombing. Um, my, where I last, last left it, my understanding was that the night before, I think a lot of us came to the conclusion that it was overwhelmingly likely that it had been an IDF bomb because of the scale of the, de uh, the the destruction and the number of deaths that had been reported at that time. By the next morning, when the scale of the deaths came down substantially and it became clear that those hospital structures hadn't been damaged in as significant a way that would have indicated it had to be a, a larger firepower and Israeli firepower, then there was some ambiguity about what had happened. And then the clearly fabricated um, or the well, at least what uh, Channel 4 News reported out was a fabricated call that was supposed to be between two Palestinian militants saying, yes, we we did this. It was an accident, but we did this um, seemed to militate again in favor of it being uh, an Israeli bomb. But I hadn't really seen any conclusive reporting about what actually had happened there. And I did think that maybe this was one of those instances where perhaps the the damage was caused by a caused by a misfire, but that, that that doesn't go that doesn't go to the bigger question of whether or not Israel does in fact target hospitals and that it has been targeting hospitals both before and ever since then. So is there evidence that I'm missing or, or new findings that I just haven't been up on that really does squarely point to um that hospital bombing being the result of an IDF bomb as opposed to a misfire? 
I think that the evidence that you just laid out about Israel doctoring an audio recording between militants, I think that just lays bare the desperation to try to prove that it was an errant missile. Why on earth would Israeli propaganda go to such lengths to actually doctor audio recordings? Similarly, what we saw to the Al-Shifa hospital, where they had to pretend like Islamic militants are talking about how many ambulances they use to um, house militants around the Strip. When you are putting out fake news and when you are putting out doctored audio recordings, that to me blames, I mean, that that really lays bare the culpability of who was behind it. Also, Al Jazeera debunked the satellite imagery that Israeli military was showing us that showed where the rockets were coming from. They tried to claim um, via satellite that it was next to this graveyard. All of that was debunked. They showed that the video was actually in reverse that the Israeli military is putting out, that it was actually mm. going away um, from Israel. So all of it was debunked, actually. And when you look at an airburst munition capability of one of these um, missiles that the U.S. is supplying Israel, the airburst capability can explode before it hits the ground. So it doesn't make that massive impact crater that we're seeing across, you know, creating just sheer devastation where it looks like nuclear bombs have hit all of these neighborhoods. So there are methods that can cause a massive amount of civilian casualties and death without actual destruction of infrastructure. Now, um, the Gaza Health Ministry actually did revise the numbers. At first, we thought it could be up to a thousand people, if not more. Mm -hmm. They did revise the numbers back down to around 500 that died mm -hmm. in that initial blast. And, and I think that this is Israel's playbook. When we're, when we're looking at the multi-billion dollar propaganda apparatus that they deploy, the playbook is to obfuscate and confuse mostly because that's why people kind of look at headlines in a very cursory way. And they're like, oh, it's just so complicated. And the Ali Arab hospital bombing was a perfect example of this because international outrage was mounting after they saw 500 people died in one attack. And that at that moment, Brie, that was the biggest, deadliest attack on Palestinians in the history of this conflict. So it was a huge deal. And mm -hmm. so once Israel saw that that international, you know, across the world, everyone was like, oh, my God, they were all condemning the attack. That's when the narrative started to get flipped on its head and obfuscated and, and very confusing. And a lot of propaganda was being put out there. And the Western media being the good stenographers that they are, they just ran with Israel's narrative without doing the investig investigative research that Al Jazeera and Channel 4 dared to do. Um, so, yes, I think the evidence is conclusive. And I think that it, it's really important to, to clarify that because when we start talking about errant missiles causing that much like death and destruction, people become confused also with the nature of, of the weaponry that uh, the resistance fighters have on the ground or Hamas militants or Islamic Jihad and other resistance groups in the area have. Never in the history of this conflict has any rocket or these kind of low-tech weapons that um, resistance fighters have have caused that much death, right? There's errant missiles that misfire all the time in the Gaza Strip. That's not new, but nowhere in the history of, uh, you know, this conflict has anything caused yeah. that sort of damage. So I think it's pretty clear at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I take, you know, I take that point entirely. There, There is a world, though, where, like, you could attribute a high death toll to the fact that we're in the middle of an ongoing genocide and ethnic cleansing and people are aggregating at hospitals and locations that they perceive to be space, uh, sorry, perceive to be uh, safe in ways that they don't usually do so that um, an errant missile, missile hitting the, the wrong place at the right time happens to mean there's a very large death toll um, just because people are more congregated than they used to. And that even though Israel is responsible nine times out of 10 and maybe thought they would actually have been responsible and, and hence their efforts to go ahead and put out propaganda, um, the doctored tapes, et cetera, to deflect blame from themselves, that it could have been like, I don't want to be in a position where I die on this particular hill when the evidence is overwhelming that Israel does target hospitals. So I just wanted to try to get, see if there was anything new that had emerged there, because I'm, I'm happy to leave this one like an unknown. Right. I mean, okay. I, I I will stake my I will stake um I will stake my my life on the fact that <laughs> I, I do not think um, in, in any way that any evidence has been presented that shows that it was an errant missile. Yeah. I really I really have not seen anything other than the lack of infrastructural damage that would typically typically be caused by a missile launched by 
Israeli forces. So other than that, and and that can be explained again. So I, I do not see any evidence um, at all. And I think that even tacitly saying that it could be an errant missile, I think is giving them, you know, too much. I mean, I think that sure. we could just leave it at that. But yeah, I think that, look, the satellite imagery as well, when Israel starts doctoring satellite imagery, the location mm. of where they claim that the missile was launched and releasing fake audio recordings. Why? Why would they do that? Yeah. Why? That certainly it, is you know? incredibly in- indicting. Uh, I, I, it, it, it sometimes over and over again, I think you're seeing in this crisis that Israel's own actions, whether it's the kind of bizarre, outlandish, unprofessional behavior of its social media operators, um, whether it's these kind of this plainly doctored uh, footage they put out, whether it's the genocidal, maniacal statements that uh, members of state and public spokespeople make with impunity on cable news programs, in many ways, they are their own worst enemy. Um, And in fact, weirdly, um, Lloyd Austin made this case recently. I'm not sure if you saw this clip. Now, Lloyd Austin is certainly no peacenik, um, you know, but he uh, was giving remarks, obviously the, the Secretary of Defense was giving these remarks where he basically made this, made the argument that frankly, the siege on Gaza and the disproportionate death uh, of and, and killing, mass killing of innocent Gazans is doing nothing other than to recruit future members of Hamas or any other resistance group that is going to want to both fight for substantive freedom for the people of Gaza, but also avenge the killing of their loved ones. This kind of a fight. The center of gravity is the civilian population. And if you drive them into the arms of the enemy, you replace a tactical victory with a strategic defeat. So I have repeatedly made clear to Israel's leaders that protecting Palestinian civilians in Gaza is both a moral responsibility and a strategic imperative. Are you surprised by that at all? I am. I am surprised by that. You know, a lot of people have posed like, Trump's administration, how different would the situation be? And I think that you would agree probably that nothing at all would be different. Perhaps maybe the veil of humanitarianism and these humanitarian corridors that Blinken's putting out mm. there to try to mask the the genocidal nature of this would perhaps be dropped. But man, I mean, there really is such a bipartisan foreign policy cons- consensus that it is it's so exemplified in situations like these and really what is the difference tangibly on the ground to Palestinians? Yes, Trump is talking about the Muslim ban and things like that. He's even going as far as saying he wants to deport, you know, Hamas sympathizers. I mean, what in the hell is he talking about? Is he talking about pro-Palestine activists? I don't know. But right now, there is a genocide going on. And for Palestinians, it's a matter of life and death. And I don't think that they're looking at the language and rhetoric coming out of the Biden administration versus the Trump administration and saying, oh, I'd rather have Trump in office because of this and that. Right now, Biden is is complicit. He is green lighting this. It is shocking to hear someone um, say that. But again, I mean, it's like just you hear Blinken saying the same thing. You know, I mean, you just heard him meeting with with Netanyahu's cabinet being like, look, you really have to minimize civilian casualties. But does it mean that these people would actually do anything to stop them? Probably not. It it does feel like it's an optics issue. I mean, there was reporting um, before the end of the ceasefire uh, that behind the scenes, the Biden administration was basically saying, look, you've got to stop with the civilian casualties because it's making it difficult to us for us to continue to provide you with aid when, frankly, I mean, this is in my words now, not theirs. You're in such obvious violation of international law. Uh, but speaking of the ceasefire, I, I did want to get you to weigh in on this debate that's going on about who's responsible. Before the ceasefire ended, Israel was already signaling that they were going to keep the siege going harder, faster, stronger than it was even before the ceasefire. Um, they claim that it's Hamas rockets, rocket attacks that justify um, the non-continuation of the ceasefire. Others have argued that um, the arrest of more Palestinians from the West Bank than were released in the hostage exchange constitutes a violation of the ceasefire and that the shooting by IDF uh, soldiers of um, a number of Palestinians, and I believe Jerusalem, 
also uh, is evidence of Israel violating the ceasefire. What what do you make of this argument? And perhaps does it mm-hmm. matter? Yes, it does matter um, who broke the ceasefire. And Israel clearly broke the ceasefire in several instances. Um, you can look just at the Gaza Strip, where Israeli soldiers were perched up sniping people who were attempting to return to their homes simply to do things like retrieve the dead. Um, my friend in Gaza was in the north. He could not physically leave, even though we're told all the time this false narrative, just flee. Well, if you don't want to die, just flee. And they're dropping leaflets saying if you stay, then you're just basically could be collateral damage and deemed um, the same as a terrorist if you stay in the north. A lot of people are disabled. A lot of people are elderly. They, they'd they rather have the pride of staying put than wandering aimlessly with shelling happening all around them with no shelter to go to. So friends of mine who are there, who, who either parents or people who are maybe physically impaired could not leave the north, they could not go back to see who had died, um, if they could retrieve the bodies of the people that they know who had died, if they could maybe dig through the rubble of their homes to retrieve whatever belongings they had left. They were so terrified of leaving because of Israeli snipers shooting dead civilians who were attempting to wander past that point. That is a violation of the ceasefire, no doubt. Um, and then you move to the occupied West Bank, and it shows you just the complete disproportionate nature of what we're told are two sides, right? This war between Hamas and Israel. It's an occupying force that has its boot on the neck of millions of people. And we're told that it's somehow an equal fight, right? Um, well, in the occupied West Bank, where 3 million Palestinians live under a complete fascist military dictatorship, um, there were hundreds of Palestinians that were rounded up and detained. There were several Palestinians that were shot dead because one of them was alleged to be celebrating, right? All of a sudden, there was this arbitrary rule that was just completely new that just said, if you celebrate the return of any of these prisoners, that's incitement to terrorism and you could be killed for it. So that's what we saw happen. And these people were doing nothing at all. Several teenage boys that were shot dead for simply just standing, waiting for the prisoners to be released and this this is this goes back to just my experience in the West Bank, seeing the cruel, barbaric nature and the humiliating nature of occupation, where we just simply attended a funeral of of a farmer tending to his olive crop who didn't turn around quickly enough to an Israeli soldier mm. yelling at him. He was killed. We went to his funeral at his home. And when we were leaving, Israeli soldiers had set up a makeshift checkpoint right out front, and they shot uh, the funeral goers with rubber bullets and tear gas. And it just shows you, how cruel this can be. That is a violation of the ceasefire, 100%. I mean, the fact that several Palestinians were killed and hundreds more rounded up. And the fact is Israel can do whatever they want with impunity because they have the total control over the situation. But Brie, if you look at the Western media, they always act like Palestinians are the ones who violate the ceasefire. And so Israel has no choice but to respond in a completely disproportionate fashion. And they just take cues from the Israeli propaganda machine. And they just are in tow with whatever they say. And we see this happen every single time. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about this uh, Israeli propaganda machine. As I alluded to earlier, I do think it feels like we've been shuttled from one um, piece of misinformation, whatever you want to call it, um, propaganda lies, to the next as the credibility of each dissolves under further scrutiny. So initially after uh, October 7th, there was reporting that there had been widespread sexual assaults, that there had been beheaded babies. The 40 beheaded babies were a permutation of that. There was a version of it where it was babies hung from a clothesline. Um, There was, uh, of course, the rhetoric about beheadings, generally speaking. Uh, And Haaretz actually came out with a piece within the last few days pointing out that although atrocities were committed on October 7th, the litany of specifically, quote unquote, barbaric atrocities that I think were being used to dehumanize Palestinians and somehow make the Palestinian deaths or deaths at the hands of Hamas, as opposed to the deaths at the hands of uh, IDF, feel substantively different, even though obviously Israel has killed scores and scores and scores and scores and scores scores more uh, uh, innocent people than Hamas has at this point. 
Since then, we've kind of moved through this. We had the El Shifa rhetoric about how there was a command and control center under the hospital that did not materialize. We had sub lies under that one about how the calendar on the wall was supposed to have been a Hamas uh, feeding schedule. We were supposed to take the five or six guns that were placed next to an MRI machine in the hospital as evidence of a command and control center. But that seems to have petered out, I think, in part because news organizations poked holes in those lies, in part because, frankly, the mass bombing of all of these hospitals in Gaza, on top of all of the educational institutions, and on top of all of the refugee camps, on top of all of these UN facilities and humanitarian aid workers, means that at a certain point, the, the lie that Hamas was underneath all of them couldn't hold water. And now it seems like we're mm -hmm. moving back into a space where specifically violence against women is being pushed forward in the media as the chief rationale as to why Hamas um, is partic in, in particular, quote unquote, barbaric, that um, the people in Gaza should need to be treated with the brutal force that they've been treated with over the last uh, six or seven weeks. And I wanted to play you this clip of an exchange between Dana Bash and Pramila Jayapal that's been getting a lot of backlash for Pramila Jayapal, arguing that she has not sufficiently condemned sexual violence against women. And I want to take that as a starting point for this, this new narrative. Let's take a listen. I want to ask you about uh, sexual violence and the... It's kind of remarkable that this issue hasn't gotten enough attention uh, globally. Widespread use of rape, uh, brutal rape, sexual violence against Israeli women by Hamas. Um, I've seen a lot of progressive women, generally speaking, they're quick to defend women's rights and speak out against using rape as a, as a weapon of war, but downright silent on what we saw on October 7th and what might be happening inside Gaza right now to these hostages. Why is that? I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that that's true. I think we, we always talk about the impact of war on women in particular. In fact, I remember 20 years ago, I did a petition around the war in Iraq. Have you said, saying have that, you talked about it since oh, October absolutely. 7th? And I've condemned what Hamas has done. I've condemned Specifically all of women. the actions. Absolutely. The, the rape, the, of course. But I think we have to remember that Israel is a democracy. That is why they are a strong ally of ours. And if they do not comply with international humanitarian law, they are bringing themselves to a place that makes it much more difficult strategically for them yeah. to be able to build the kinds of allies to keep public opinion yeah. with them. And frankly, uh, morally, I think we cannot say that one war crime deserves another. That is not what international humanitarian with, with, law says. Okay, with, with respect, I was just asking about the the women, and you turned it back to Israel. I'm asking you about Hamas, in fact. I already answered your question, Dana. I, I said it's horrific, and okay. I think that rape is horrific, sexual assault is horrific. I think that it happens in war situations. Terrorist organizations like Hamas obviously are using these as tools. Mm -hmm. However, I think we have to be balanced about bringing in the outrages against Palestinians. Yeah. 15,000 Palestinians have been killed in Israeli airstrikes, three quarters of whom and it's, are women and children. And it's horrible, but you're, you don't see Israeli soldiers raping um Well, Dana, I think women. we're not, we're not. Oh my All God. All right, I see the look on your face. Okay, I won't say anything. Oh, Go for oh it, Abby. <laughs> Okay, first of all, that's untrue. There's plenty of articles and investigations that show that Israeli soldiers have conducted rape and sexual violence of Palestinian prisoners. Just Google it, Dana Bash, you can learn something. And second yeah. of all, this narrative uh, about October 7th, I mean, let's explore this really quickly because this this really needs to be kind of dissected here because ever since October 7th happened, which was a, a national tragedy for Israel, they said it was their 9-11, um, a lot of civilians did die. Um, a lot of soldiers, and I, I don't know how many armed settlers died. That that statistic has not been put out there yet. But let's just look at what happened in Israeli media um, since then. A lot of witnesses from the kibbutzes that were attacked and said that a lot of hostages died through crossfire. We don't know exactly how many, but I would say at least a couple dozen, according to the Israeli witnesses and survivors of that situation. The death toll had to be quietly revised from 1,400 down to 1,200 because they found out that 
tons of the cars that were burned and the carnage that we saw at the Nova Festival was actually done by Israeli Apache helicopter pilots, indiscriminate shelling from tanks into those cars that burned actually 200 Hamas fighters that they initially thought were Israeli citizens. So my question, when you look at something like that, especially the aerial photos, it looks like something like the highway of death when the Mm. U.S. retreated from the Gulf War. How could these resistance fighters' weapons have done something like that? I mean, clearly that was done by shelling and bombing from Israeli air power. We know that the Air Force was was out in full force that day. So I think that as the narrative kind of fell apart, especially with the atrocity propaganda that was put out there with the 40 beheaded babies and the systematic mass rape. Now, I don't know if rape happened or not. I am completely open to the evidence that something like that did happen. The problem is when you say it's systematic mass rape and you repeat Mm -hmm. that over and over again, that in, that implies that it was used as a weapon. It's the humanizing propaganda that Hamas resistance fighters used rape as a weapon and as a tool. I have not seen any evidence of that. The LA Times had to retract the fact that that was put out there initially. The UN, mm-hmm. this investigative body that, that Jayapal is talking about, that Israel needs to comply with, they actually tried to conduct an investigation and went to Israeli authorities and said, show us the evidence for mass rape. We want to document this. And they were called anti-Semitic. And Israel Mm -hmm. said, we don't want to work with an anti-Semitic body that is questioning these claims. So how are these claims supposed to be taken seriously if Israel won't even comply with an investigative body like the UN that is supposed to be the, the standard bearer, right, of international law that should be applied equally throughout the world? Um, so it's cartoonish and ridiculous, Brie. And when you look at something, I want to go back really quickly to this NACU babies, the, the Washington Post headline that said that, I don't even know, it's, it's such mental gymnastics to try to even think about how they they phrased that headline to just essentially just say invading Israeli soldiers left NACU babies to die, which was exactly going back to the Gulf War, the propaganda that we were told necessitated us to invade Iraq in the first mm-hmm. place, because Saddam was such a brutal dictator and so barbaric that he was ripping babies out of incubators and throwing them on the ground to die. Well, that is happening right now in Gaza, and no one seems to care. And you have institutions like the Washington Post bending over backwards to try to excuse war crimes and atrocities. And people like Dana Bash wanting people to condemn Hamas, to condemn Hamas. Oh, no, this isn't about Israel and its massive war crimes that they are pledging to commitment more and more and more. And the 70% victims, I mean, of women and children, half children dead, at least 8,000. It is inhumane. And Dana Bash, all she wants to do is talk about unproven allegations of sexual violence because they are desperate, desperate to greenlight what is going on. They're desperate to dehumanize Palestinians, to prepare us for what is coming and what is happening. And it is a disgrace. I don't know how these people call themselves journalists. Has she not seen the footage? Has she not seen what is going on in the ground? I mean, it's crazy to me. Look, I know that you can lose your job and that you have to be a willing agent of empire and Israeli propaganda in order to have that job. Look at what happened to Mehdi Hassan right? Even though he was tiptoeing very carefully and trying to do the both sides thing for a long time. But because he was too hard hitting to Israeli officials, he was shit canned. And and people like Dana Bash are a joke to the profession. How dare she? Yeah. I mean, going back to that Haaretz piece that cleared up some of the post 10-7 misinformation, I don't like saying this because I don't want to be in a position, my own humanity is implicated by, you know, minimizing the real tragedy of innocent lives that were lost. But even they found that only, only, you know, but one, one baby was killed on October 7th. And when you think about the, the ink that was spilled over the narrative that babies, Hamas kills babies, Hamas kills targeted all of these babies and contrast that with the indifference with which not just these five babies that were left to die in the NICU, the difference with that is treated, but to your point, the thousands upon thousands of Palestinian children that have been killed by IDF, by the IDF, 
hearing them watching the video of their or their parents and other rescuers around as they call out from the inside of fallen buildings that they can't excavate because they still don't have the fuel to power the machines that be able to do so. I mean, it really does. I mean, it, it is gruesome. It is ghoulish for her to be lambasting um, Pramila Jayapal in this way. When Pramila Jayapal said the obligatory, and not just obligatory, but I think Right. meaningfully felt, yes, of but course, these are atrocities that I condemn. Nothing's enough. Nothing's enough. And to be clear, just, no. th- but this might strain credulity, but Pramila Jayapal got bashed on the internet over this. Um, I'll read a couple of tweets. Uh, Hamas spokesperson Pramila Jayapal this week tried to do damage control for her hateful comments. <laughs> um, Steve Guest writes, Democrat uh, Pramila Jayapal tries to downplay and defend Hamas's rape and sexual violence against Israeli uh, women. Victoria Brownsworth tweeted um, when asked about the rape of Israeli women. Uh, Jayapal says she finds rape horrific, then says it's a tool of war. These women were in their beds at home at 6 a.m. around a mu- movie, uh, music fest, not at war. As though anything that Pramila Jayapal Paul said, indicated that she thought it was justified or anything other than deplorable. In fact, the White House was asked to weigh in on this today. And Karine Jean-Pierre, um, you know, kind of reaffirmed that what Hamas did was absolutely reprehensible, et cetera, et cetera. And Republicans are upset that she didn't go as far as condemning Pramila Jayapal. So that's the state of play. But still staying on this point, I don't know if you followed this, but there's a... Um, a journalist kind of in the social media space named Owen Jones, who was one of the few more left-leaning people to have an opportunity to view the um, video compilation the that Israel put video, together. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm trying to be diplomatic about it. But yes, the propaganda right, no. video um, that they put together. And he trended for most of last week for the crime of pointing out that although many atrocities were in this video, that he found it to be difficult to watch and stomach turning and death and violence is obviously bad and condemnable. He said that nowhere in the video, this is a direct quote, he said, if there was torture, there's no evidence given for it on camera. If there were, was rape and sexual violence committed, we don't see this in the footage either. Now, for the crime of pointing out that for all of the horrors that are on the video, it does not actually corroborate Israel's claim that there was torture or rape. He's been getting dogpiled as someone who is also an apologist for torture and rape. And that combined with the Jayapal clip and combined with the clip that I'm about to show you really makes me feel like this is kind of the the, the last big misinformational battleground that the IDF is trying to fight in the in the wake of October 7th. Armand, can you pull up the clips of the State Department spokesperson um, making the argument about the hostages and the rape? In response to the, one of the questions about uh, sexual violence, I'm just interested because the phrasing that you used was uh, curious to me, at least. Um, you said... Um, you have no reason to doubt any reports that, that rape was used as uh, sexual uh, you know, sexual violence was used by Hamas. Uh, you said the fact that they, meaning Hamas, continue to hold women hostages, okay, that is a fact. The fact that they continue to hold children hostages, that is also a fact. But then you said the fact that it seems one of the reasons they don't want to turn women over that they've been holding hostage and the reason that the pause fell apart is that they don't want those women to be able to talk about what happened to them during their time in uh, captivity. Um, the fact that it seems, Maybe. why do you, is, that, is this just conjecture on your part or, or do you know, do you, do you have very good reason to believe, evidence to, to believe that Hamas is deliberately continuing to hold on to female hostages because they're concerned that they will speak about atrocities that were that they were subjected to. So I will accept the edit, not fact. Seems is a better way to say it. But let me let me answer the, let me an- answer the question. Um, the humanitarian pause, which resulted in uh, an ex- a release of hostages, was negotiated with some very clear terms, and that was that children and women would be the first priority to be released. Um, Near the end of that pause, last Wednesday, Thursday, when we were getting towards the end, uh, Hamas was still holding on to women that should have been the next to be released. They refused to release them. Uh, They broke the deal. 
came up with excuses why. Ultimately, I don't think any of those excuses were credible, and I shouldn't get into any of them here. Um, but certainly one of the, the, the reasons that a number of people believe they refused to release them is they didn't want people to hear what those women would have to say publicly. Well, I, don't, I, 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 I won't say fact because I don't know it for a fact. Oh, okay. it's, well, that's without, a number of people believe. Let me just. A number of people believe. Uh-huh. 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 That's where we're at. So the, the argument that's being made here, the, the, the soft argument that that, that was um, Matt Miller, State Department spokesperson, he had earlier made the, the claim that it seemed uh, it seems like a fa- the fact that he used that language, the fact that these uh, female hostages weren't released because allegedly Hamas didn't want them to be able to speak to the press about their treatment and specifically that they had suffered sexual abuse at the hands of Hamas. Now, I was struck by this for a number of reasons, but I want to give you an opportunity uh, to weigh in here first. I mean, it's striking because it just shows you the complete and total evidence-free allegations that can be peddled by State Department officials. I mean, this is who is answering the official press corps about the most important thing happening in the world right now, a genocide that is being greenlit, backed and funded by U.S. tax dollars. And serious questions are being raised by reporters about the evidence behind such allegations that have facilitated this. And you have State Department spokesperson just saying, yeah, it's like it's like a game of telephone. It's just like, yep, friend of a friend of a friend said that maybe this is why it's it's unbelievable that this is where we're at, that you have someone like him just saying, yeah, that's probably why. That's probably why that they never released the women because they're being systematically raped, even though there was no proof of systematic rape in the initial attack. But let's just throw that out there just to evoke emotion, just to make people super pissed and just to put it out there, right? Another evidence-free allegation to put out there so newspapers can print it. So this can just be the new talking point to dehumanize Palestinians even more as they are being massacred in front of our eyes. It it, it gets lower every day. I mean, my bought my threshold for like what is possible for what these people are doing um, to collaborate with Israel is is unbelievable. But this is a new low, Brie. So so what we also learned from that clip is that Hamas has given unsurprisingly an explanation for why they think the ceasefire was viol- uh, violated. Mm-hmm. Now, Miller brushes that off saying, I'm not going to get into their, quote, excuses. I don't think that they are, quote, credible. But certainly it does seem to be of public interest what it is that they say they see as a failure to act in good faith on the behalf of the idea. That seems at least as newsworthy as your conjecture about why it is that Hamas didn't release, uh, continue to release the remaining um, women that are hostages. Moreover, it seems like this is in such direct contradiction with what we do know factually has been given as testimony from released hostages on both sides. I think it has been a public relations boondoggle for Israel that there have been now a number of hostages who either themselves or their families have been willing to speak to the press who have testified to their humane treatment with Hamas. Now, that, of course, is not to say they wanted to be captured by Hamas. They don't resent and hate that they were kept in captivity for weeks, that they deserved any such treatment or anything like that. But person after person, to the extent that Israel is allowing people to speak to the press, people who were in Hamas's custody seem to be uniformly affirming that they ate what Hamas ate, that they they shared food. There was testimony that there was a story out that um, a mother was talking about how her daughter now, who her daughter was taken hostage, offers everybody her food before she eats in, in a way that one might perceive as kind of gracious or kind or polite or giving of the little girl to do. But the framing of the story was, daughter never did this before, now she does. This is evidence of inhumane treatment by Hamas. So on one hand, we have Israeli prisoner, uh, sorry, uh, Israeli prisoners, yes, who are giving those stories affirming that they were treated equally. We have some video footage that, you know, you can take with a grain of salt. You can say these people still have loved ones in uh, captivity. So, of course, they weren't going to come out against Hamas. And, of course, they were going to be friendly as they were getting released. But there is now video footage of people seemingly giving warm handshakes and pads on the back and things like that with 
um, members of Hamas as they are being released. And on the flip side, we now have Palestinians who are being released who are specifically saying that they were treated brutally, that they were beat, and that sexual assault and rape was a part of their experience when being kept in the custody of Israel. So it does sometimes feel to me that every accusation is an admission when it's coming from these IDF members. And the direct contradiction between this framing that's now coming from our own State Department spokesperson and the actual testimony that we have from prisoners that have been released both by Israel and by Hamas is really speaking volumes. Right. I mean, I, I think that that is, a, is an important phrase. Every accusation is an admission because we saw also the accusation that um, Hamas militants ripped a baby out of a pregnant woman's stomach and mm -hmm. also the accusation that they actually threw children into a furnace. I mean, just really mm -hmm. kind of depraved um, levels of, uh, you know, I mean, barbarism, really. And when you look back at, during the 80s, um, Israeli soldiers actually did do that, Brie, um, in one of the massacres, in one of the many massacres against Palestinians. Yeah. Now, it, it it's just crazy to me. And then when you search, you know, that phrase, like a, a, an infant ripped out of a pregnant mother, it all is overshadowed by the false story that you can barely find the facts that are proven about the actual massacre that happened in the 80s um, to Palestinians. So again, I don't know if this is a tactic to kind of flood the, the reality of the situation with all of these falsehoods and, and overshadow the truth, but or if it's just completely dehumanizing atrocity propaganda to just try to foster that attitude from American citizens, especially because let's remember, all of the Israeli officials direct their propaganda to us. Americans are the ones who are providing aid and weapons to the Israeli state. We completely subsidize everything that they're doing, the ethnic cleansing, the apartheid and the genocide. So that is why they carefully construct these talking points to us. We are, we're the saps here. We're the dupes mm. and we're the targets. Um, Israeli citizens know exactly what's going on. They are fascist as hell. Polling came out that showed that only 1.8% of Israelis disagree with the amount of firepower that the uh, IDF is using in Gaza. So they're right on board with this genocidal onslaught. They want to take back and recolonize Gaza. They lost the narrative. They lost that international um, outrage about October 7th once, once all of these stories fell apart. And so they needed to get that going again. They needed to gin up the hysteria again. And that's why you see a new round uh, of commentators going around talking about the sexual violence. That's why you see this propaganda video um, being put together and put out for journalists. It, it's amazing, too, because you mentioned um, a journalist that actually went and saw that October 7th body cam footage that has been mm -hmm. put together by yeah, the IDF just... and, and showed to a very select group of journalists. And I think a lot of people have pointed out really interesting things that don't really make sense about that footage. Why is it that this isn't being released to all media, right? Why can't we all see this to prove all the allegations that Israel is telling us are true and that are proven with the body cam footage? I'm open to seeing it. I would, I, I, I you know, I, I really want to see exactly what happened, um, documented by the fighters themselves. Let's see it. The problem is that um, a lot of the allegations are unfounded and not proven on the videos. Look, like you said, atrocities were committed, war crimes were committed. I cherish the sanctity of human life. I don't want any civilians to die. I cherish life. That is why I'm so uh, shocked and aghast at, at the complete lack of respect for Palestinian life. And that is why I am, I'm, I'm so dedicated to try to unmasking this propaganda because it is so horrifying and atrocious to see this happening. Um, but yeah, when you look at October 7th, when journalists go to these screenings, they're actually told beforehand, not only can you not talk about what you see, but you're about to see video footage of child mutilation. And one of the reporters that saw it, he said, wait, nothing in this. I mean, wow, yeah. that's a really shocking and bold claim that you're about to see child mutilation. Oh, my God. And as we know, I think one of the only things that the video does show is um, a Hamas fighter throwing a grenade and potentially a child um, not being able to hear after the grenade went off and potentially killing his father in a shelter, if I'm not mistaken. And that that is alleged to be child mutilation. Now, when mm -hmm. you compare that to the actual claims that were put out and are still parroted even by our president, um, that 40 babies were beheaded 
it's a pretty stark contrast of what the truth is. Yeah. And, and to your point, I mean, many people have been circulating um, this new uh, Haaretz piece that came out, uh, the title of which is Hamas's campaign of rape against Israeli women is revealed testimony after testimony. When you open the article and you actually read it, the article itself says, quote, thus far, the commission has not taken testimony directly, but it will begin to do so soon. So the headline doing all of the work, there just isn't any testimony corroborating this. And of course, I think we'd all agree, as Pramila Jayapal said, if there was evidence of this, it would be horrible. And we would like to be able to confirm or deny it. But your point, Abby, about the UN being precluded from doing that investigation, there was a story about the incinerated cars um, that were burned up on October 7th being buried. Arguably, they're being buried because uh, funeral rites and an inability to get the bodies out of the car means that that's the way you put people to rest. But other people say this is a way to cut off any investigation into who's responsible for incinerating all of those people in their cars. Um, and furthermore, some people have been arguing, well, there, of course, there's no testimony from the rape victims. They were killed. And I, this is so gruesome and I and I and it's macabre and I would prefer not to be having to have these conversations. But quite obviously, we live in the 21st century where we have rape kits designed for exactly this kind of purpose. And I don't know how you can have news stories about how the IDF can provide for the widows of fallen soldiers to collect semen samples from fallen soldiers, but we live in a world we don't have the same expectation that with accusations of not just singular rapes, but widespread rape, that was what Dana Bash called it, widespread rape, that there wouldn't be any interest in confirming those atrocities, both for, in the interest of the families of the victims and for the historical record. So if the, it is true, there isn't specious speculation. Why wouldn't you conduct rape kits on people that you allege to have been raped? Instead, what we're treated to is photographs of women with blood on them. And we're, we're, we're mm -hmm. told that this is evidence in and of itself. Look, it may or may not be, but given what this kind of testimony, false testimony has been used to justify, I think folks are more than entitled to getting some concrete evidence before they jump to conclusions especially because we know what Israeli soldiers did on October 7th, which was, um, you know, wantonly uh, kill a lot of Israeli citizens themselves. I mean, we we heard testimony yeah. from Israelis corroborating this. So, yes, given what has fallen yes. apart with what the propaganda they put out, of course, I want to know exactly what happened. I want to know exactly what happened um, because it's being used to justify genocide, Brie. And, you know, you mentioned the prisoners versus the hostages. I think that that's really important as well, because they want to paint Hamas as um, barbaric ISIS type individuals who have no morality, no humanity. They just wake up in the morning and they say, how many Jews can we kill today? That's what they want to paint them as. And the reality is that, um, yes, anti-Semitism probably does have a role to play because that's the only Jewish people they know and they see are the colonizing forces that control their lives and kill their family and friends. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's just so it's just so beyond the pale that we are being treated like children um, and we are just being told that anti-Semitism is what's fueling this attack. And Biden and, and all the people in Biden's cabinet calling October 7th as consequential as the Holocaust, as if anti-Semitism is what's driving Palestinian hatred against Israeli citizens and not the obvious nature of what colonization and occupation does to people. And that's why they want to paint October 7th in such a cartoonish fashion. That's why they want to pretend like all of these and look, atrocities were committed. Again, like I don't need to to belabor the point that yes, civilians died. It was horrible, but we have to not look at anything in a vacuum. And when they want to paint October seventh, let, let's just say like they let's did say civilians were killed. Yeah, let's not be let's right. not be victims of the same kind of passive voice that we're accusing yeah, them of. Yeah, let's yeah. say civilians were killed. You, you know, let's that's that's not difficult to say. Yeah, but go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I mean, it's just like how we were told 9-11 was because they hated us for our freedoms. I mean, it's really as yeah. cartoonish as that. And yeah. and we have to look at why 9-11 happened, what was behind Osama bin Laden's vengeance, what what's behind October 7th. I think tactically, as we know also from Haaretz investigations, that 
Not only did Israeli soldiers um, indiscriminately fire upon cars and houses and shell yeah. Israeli citizens, we don't exactly know how many, but they also pro proved that Hamas resistance fighters did not know about the festival happening. They didn't go paraglide into these kibbutzes, which you could also use, say, are being used as human shields. Why are kibbutzes right on the border, uh, on the yeah. fortified border fence where Gaza is? It's very odd. It's like you're right in the way of where the rockets are 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 shooting like why would you have kibbutzes there but anyway they didn't know about the festival yeah. clearly the strategy and was purposeful to take as many hostages alive as they could so they could negotiate it was a bargaining chip the same reason that they shoot rockets they want to provide some sort of leverage over israel because they have none that is why people support mm -hmm. hamas also because they provide social services they are the elected government of the Gaza Strip. They're not just some rogue terrorist organization who is just committing terrorist acts. It, it, it's just so ridiculous. They are an elected government body and they are using what they can to get things from Israel, concessions and leverage. That is why the rockets happened and that's why this attack happened. And you saw that come, I mean, you saw that come to fruition with this hostage exchange. It was very deliberate and it was, in, it, it was intended to get prisoners out. Unfortunately, it came at a huge cost. And, and I think them holding the hostages left is probably one of the only things deterring Israel from just completely carpet bombing the remaining area of the Strip. It's it's a dire situation. Yeah, I mean, it's worth knowing just on a plain fact reporting basis um, that now 1.1 uh, million people, is it, that are internally uh, displaced reports from the ground is that there's basically nowhere to go. There were a number of... Um, Gazan journalists who tweeted despondently over the weekend about how, I mean, they just feel like they there's nothing else that they can do, that they're just trying to stay alive at this point, that they feel not hopeless, but overwhelmed by the sheer scale of the destruction. What is it? 80% of all residential housing has now been destroyed. There was a really um, macabre uh, a clip going around of an Israeli officials explaining that there was one location that everybody should uh, immigrate to that is, um, do what I'm talking about, uh, a very, really yeah. a small, a really small, it's like the size of like a, it's like asking 2 million people to go to the size of, I think, LAX. It was described as the size of a, some kind of American airport. There is, there is, there is a river, there is a place in Gaza called the Muasi. The Muasi is the place where they all can have shelters. Uh, together with international organizations, we created shelters for the Palestinian people. No, so you cannot say Israel is not you know, no, facilitating but, 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 that. But together with humanitarian aid. This is where she's talking about. A desolate wasteland of sand dunes next to the Mediterranean Sea. There is no aid in Al Mawazi. There are no aid agency tents. There are no food kitchens. There is no help here. Um, and when there was video of that location, it's just empty, a, a wasteland. There's no humanitarian support the way that the uh, IDF um, uh, official or Israeli official had alleged. I mean, it really is levels of destruction. The 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 cost of disease uh, is about to mount as people continue not to have access to medicine or water. Food is now running out. And in the middle of this, we're getting, you know, American media uh attacking uh, Pramila Jayapal for not condemning unsubstantiated rapes hard enough, uh, apparently. It's, the, the one it's th yeah, go ahead. Unbelievable, Brie. I mean, there's really, I mean, there's nothing more to say than that. I mean, there's there's 80% yeah. of people are displaced and there's nowhere to go. And I, I just, I hear this all the time. It's like, well, they're told to flee. If you stay, you know what's coming to you. It's like, where are they supposed to go? And even if Egypt did open the borders. So that's okay for us to just sit back and accept the fact that 2.3 million people are being e ethnically cleansed before our yeah. eyes. They don't want to go to another country. That's their home. Yeah. I mean, it's also worth noting, you mentioned the reporting about uh, Hamas not knowing that the festival was going to be there. The New York Times reported, I think over last weekend, that Israel knew Hamas's attack plan more than a year ago and declined to respond to intelligence and instead took, of course, uh, IDF soldiers from uh, the border, Gaza border and decided to use them to do their unlawful terrorism in the West Bank. And that's part of why so many Israeli citizens hold Netanyahu's government responsible for uh, October 7th in the first place. 
before we get out of here, I've already kept you for over an hour. I, I did want to ask you um, about uh, this new resolution that will be voted on tonight, I believe, as we're recording. Um, this is how it's characterized by by Ryan Graham at The Intercept. He says, a new House resolution, which may be voted on as early as tonight, quote, clearly and firmly states that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. This comes after a previous resolution hinted at that claim, but did not fully state it. So now Congress wants to leave no question, but there's an additional trap Anybody who votes against this resolution will be said to have voted against condemning anti-Semitism. Now, you're someone who has been a victim of the BDS movement. You are an illustration of how it seems like there is no safe quarter, no nonviolent way to protest that is considered to be socially acceptable. I wanted to give you a a chance to uh, respond to this and ask you where you think the BDS movement is now post October 7th. I think first we need to clarify what Zionism is, because Israelis and Zionists will say it's just a homeland for Jews without articulating the fact that it is an an exclusively Jewish state, which means that you have to maintain an artificial Jewish majority based on the expulsion of the indigenous inhabitants. That is what it is. So if we're clear about that, um, no, I I mean, I, I am an avowed anti-Zionist, as well as millions of Jewish people around the world who um, completely reject the notion of conflating a beautiful, peaceful religion with an ethno state that is commit- committing apart- apartheid, excuse me, ethnic cleansing and genocide. So it is a disgrace that this is where we're at, that they are so concerned with holding on to this notion that if you do not support what Israel is doing, then you are an anti-Semite, that this is the extreme length that they are willing to go, Brie. I mean, just look at the disconnect between the ruling class and the people of this country. The overwhelming majority of Democratic voters agree that we should have a permanent ceasefire, and the majority of Republican voters agree that we should have a permanent ceasefire. The overwhelming majority of young people in this country are taking direct action. Millions of people are taking to the streets every single day. There are actions, people putting their bodies on the lines to try to stop what is happening in our name. And our politicians are just going about business as usual, completely ignoring what their constituents are demanding because they are so concerned with entrenching their power and their pocketbooks. I mean, lining their pocketbooks, it is absolutely disgusting. Yes, we know that APAC has a ridiculous amount of power in this country and and lobbying money, and they have already threatened anyone, like members of the squad, right? The fact that the fact that Rashida Talib, the only Palestinian in Congress, was censored because she just spoke out about genocide happening against her people, right? And then you have just a couple disparate few members of Congress speaking out against this. And that has galvanized the entire body to try to denounce. Any criticism of Israel conflated with anti-Semitism. You have these preemptive BDS laws on the books, anti-BDS laws that forbid you from criticizing Israel if you want to be contracted to work in states. This has happened in over half of the states in the country. Actual Israeli government officials go and lobby to state legislatures to try to enact these laws. It is outrageous. It is unconstitutional. It is flagrant violation of the First Amendment. And I mean, I'm sorry, we have the right to criticize Israel. Of course we do. Israel's committing genocide in our name. Apartheid and genocide are two crimes against humanity. There is no greater crime than the crime of genocide. And this is what our politicians are wasting their time doing, is passing ridiculous, meaningless resolutions that try to conflate and obfuscate the nature of their crimes. And we should be super crystal clear about that, because I think that at this point, um, if anyone thinks that there's a lesser of two evil looking at both parties and the situation in Gaza right now, I don't think that there's any argument to be made. I mean, Joe Biden, this is his legacy. He is genocide Joe, and he needs to be punished for what he's done. Um, and it's it's unbelievable, Bree, that we're going to be browbeaten about the lesser of two evils in just about a year, actually less than a year, going into this next election after Joe Biden and his cabinet have committed the worst crime that humanity can commit. And um, it's going to be a long road ahead for people who are trying to be on the side of truth and justice in this country, because it's time to organize for revolutionary change. Yeah, I think that's well said. I mean, I I do wonder, do you know if the BDS movement has 
gotten more traction in the wake of the uh, siege on Gaza and as death counts amount. We've obviously seen uh, a huge outpouring of um, protest movements, often led by members of the Jewish community, whether it's Jewish Voice for Peace or Not in Our Name. Um, but is that translating, do you know, into an, an increased interest in people boycotting various pol uh, products? Because it does seem that the reaction, the negative reaction to BDS does suggest that there is real power in a kind of economic boycott movement. There is. And this is what actually brought down apartheid in South Africa, finally. And it wasn't so much boycotting South African products. I think that as we're in this globalized capitalist system, it's going to be pretty hard to like bring down Microsoft. And, you know, I mean, things mm -hmm. like that are, are very difficult to do. Puma and Starbucks like that. Yeah, of course, I advise no one to shop from those um, entities who are supporting Israel's genocide. But the problem is, I think, um, beyond that, I'm, not the problem, but the solution is to isolate Israel from the global community. And that's how apartheid in South Africa really did collapse eventually. Academic boycotts, music, you know, people refusing to play in Israel, people refusing to go. If you are an international figure, do not perform in Israel, do not go to academic conferences in Israel. And Israelis forbid Israelis from participating in the global community until they forcefully denounce what's happening in their government. And right now we're not seeing that happen, Brie, but, but fortunately the cultural boycott is very strong and it's shaming artists and politicians and other prominent figures to boycott Israel. And that is a, that is a big badge of shame for Israeli society because they like to tout themselves as progressive. You even saw Jay Paul yeah. claimed that it was a democracy. Well, there is no democracy that's based on on you know an institutionalized, segregated state that um, has second class citizens with a, with a different set of laws. So that's a farce, and all of this is is being exposed and revealed more and more. But I encourage people to really entrench that cultural boycott call because you can really reach people like musicians and celebrities and things like that. And, and once those people drop Israel as sponsors and they're dropping them like flies, I mean, Israel can barely pull anyone other than Gal Gadot. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the more atrocities they commit, the more people are going to want to distance themselves from Israel. And that's, I think, where the power lies, especially for people to really shame and name the people who are, who are um, collaborating with this apartheid regime, especially at this at this moment. But look, if they weren't scared of BDS, they wouldn't have wasted their time and energy preemptively putting these anti-BDS laws on the book because they know the tide of justice is coming and they know what will inevitably happen, which is forcing the hand of Israel to either install a democratic state with equal rights for all or uh, the two-state solution that even Hamas calls for. I mean, Hamas's charter calls for the 1967 Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its center and distinctly distinguishes between political Zionism and Judaism. So again, this notion that Hamas is not reasonable, they're just some rogue terrorist organization. Look, look at what they are saying today. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it's it's just, again, no one's actually looking at the facts. And really, when you point, um, when you try to compare the two, it's Israel, who is the rogue state, who has never accepted a Palestinian state, who always wanted the West Bank. And they're using this opportunity, um, their 9-11, this national tra tragedy to want to recolonize not only Gaza, but colonize as much as the West Bank as they can. And you even saw Israeli commanders say, let's not stop there. Let's take Beirut and let's take Syria. So mm -hmm. it needs to stop, Bree. We need to stop thinking of this in terms of appropriate responses to October 7th and the elimination of Hamas and really look at it with wide open eyes and see exactly what Israel's doing and what the U.S. is facilitating them to do and do everything in our power to stop it. A Amen to that, Abby. I always appreciate talking to you so much. You you're, you've been incredibly brave. You've taken on the Israel lobby. You've, you've taken on all uh, these kind of anti-BDS laws. It sounds like you might be ready to take on the Bayhive as well as you call for these kind of culture boycotts. I don't know if you saw that Beyonce was getting some flack, I think deserved flack, um, for um, airing her Renaissance um, concert film in Israel. And immediately after it aired, there were scores of TikTok videos of um, Israelis appropriating uh, one of her kind of Black power anthems uh, as a 
uh, symbol of Israeli resistance in a way that I think was pretty predictable and isn't really a good look uh, for someone who has dressed up as a Black Power militant and the like the way that Beyonce has. Um, so I look forward to continuing this discussion. Obviously, you're welcome back anytime. As I said, you're one of the most important voices in this space, and I'm so grateful for you. Let the people know where they can find you and your shows on the internet and beyond. Thanks, Bri. I really appreciate the time. Uh, Gaza Fights for Freedom. I really encourage everyone to watch it. GazaFightsForFreedom.com. It's available in tons of different languages. And this is really what shows you what Israel did to Palestinians when they nonviolently resisted and had a mass act of civil disobedience. They were mowed down by Israeli snipers, including protected categories at the Geneva Conventions. And, and there was just no accountability at all um, from the international community and no Actually, barely anyone talked about it from from the West. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, when peaceful resistance is prevented, violent resistance is inevitable. And, mm. you know, we shouldn't look at October 7th in a vacuum. We have to really be we have to really crystallize our vision and see what is what is going on, how this how the occupation and the siege precipitates and facilitates violence. And it won't ever stop until we get to the root of that violence. GazaFightsForFreedom.com. Check it out. Um, we have a reporting from Palestine playlist on the Empire Files from the Occupied West Bank. Tons of videos breaking down a bunch of different issues with an Israeli society, kind of revealing the breadth and scope of Israeli racism. Um, just a bunch of different stuff. I encourage people to check it out and um, hopefully it can instruct their uh, perspective of what's going on. Thanks again, Bree. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you for that, Abby. Thank you to all of you for listening. Thank you for getting us almost to 100,000 on YouTube. I appreciate any likes uh, in lieu of subscription to the podcast, obviously. Just liking and supporting your favorite left media outlets on social media is a, is a big deal. So do go over and follow and subscribe to the Empire Files as well. Thank you to all that do subscribe. If you're interested, you know you can find an additional episode of Bad Faith every week on Mondays at patreon.com slash Podcast. Take care of yourselves. I know it's a lot of heavy topics. Um, it's a lot, honestly. Uh, but I've really appreciated being able to share this space with you guys uh, and get through it day by day. Take care of yourselves and keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.